And boom. Hello. How's it going, Christina? It's going great. How about you? I'm doing good. Yeah. Thank you for uh, for being on. I'm glad to. So I found, I kind of discovered you through your your book. Uh, it popped up on Amazon, the uh, Winner Takes All, which is the the story of, of Steve Wynn in and, and Las Vegas and all that kind of stuff, right? Right. Um, but then I did some more research on you and you've done, you seem to have like all this other crazy fun stuff you do. You seem to live a very fun, exciting life. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, I, um, <laughs> pinch myself sometimes. I don't know how oh, okay. I always tell people, like, people say, how do you create your career? And I'm like one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. Just keep saying yes to opportunity. I don't know, you know, but yeah, I have, um, I do have a pretty good time. Cool. And they yeah. all come back together, like, you know, that like Steve Wynn in Las Vegas is still a part of my life, but I have all these other things going on too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny how things just kind of uh, almost accumulate like that, where it's just kind of you're just going through life and things are happening and it's it's good and bad, but then you look back and it's like, man, I've really done a lot of stuff. Or you know, it's fun to look back at that stuff. I think. Yeah, it is. Very much. So yeah, I mean, like how. If someone, you know, you're at a party or something and someone asks you what you do, how do you kind of respond to that? What do you, what do you tell them? Um, you know, it's never, I mean, it sort of depends on the context because sometimes people, you know, I get a sense that people are really going to be interested in the kind of thing I work on and, and then I'll tell them, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I, you know, I write a lot about fashion and culture and I'll, you know, and sometimes it's just people, you know, it's kind of a cursory thing and I'll just say, I'm a journalist. So, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I could go. A long way. People tend to, I notice now that I have spent quite a few years writing about the fashion world, people tend to be much more interested in that at cocktail parties and dinners and mm -hmm. things like that. When um, they, my, the work is I spent 10 years writing about casinos in the gambling world and um, people are more specific about that. Like men are much more interested in Las Vegas than women are, for instance. And, okay. Um, and so it sort of, sometimes it can be a total conversation killer. If you say, I write about Las Vegas. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's good. You got the backup of, of fashion, I guess, to, to keep a conversation going though. Yeah. Fashion makes me popular with my kids' friends. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. You just, you cover such a wide, like range of topics it seems like it's crazy where so like how did this all begin when did this I don't know what's the story like how did uh how did Vegas how did you get interested in Vegas and get started with all that history well that was I mean all of these things are sort of opportunities that fell in front of me and I had um I never would have thought of myself as writing about Las Vegas ever. I mean, it's, I had no interest in it and I'd never been there when I took over, took the job. But, um, I was, I was a writer at the wall street journal. I was living in Atlanta and the bureau chief in Los Angeles, who was looking for a reporter to cover Las Vegas, saw some wor work that I'd done that he thought was funny. It made him laugh. And it just, that made him think that I should come out and write about Las Vegas. So they offered me the job and I came out and, um, and it turned out to be, just I was like a pig in mud I mean it's Las Vegas is so full of personalities mm -hmm. so so and it's a place I just got completely fascinated with how it works so things that are are totally mundane to to people who work in casinos are utterly fascinating to mm -hmm. us who don't like even like how do they wheel around all that cash you know that kind of stuff so oh, um, yeah. I spent 10 years just um excited every day about what I was getting to write on. But then, then, <clears throat> then I took time off and wrote the book. And um, when I came back to the Wall Street Journal after writing the book, another editor saw something that I, an editor assigned me to drive a Ferrari and write about it. And, Ooh, um, and that, that was fun. fun. It was fun. Yeah. That's like a whole nother story. But that anyways, another editor saw that story and thought, oh, she should write about fashion. <laughs> and I okay. Said, I don't know anything about fashion. <laughs> what are you talking about? And here I am. So. Right. <laughs> I'm not kidding you when I say I really do think that a, a life plan can be just keep walking in the direction that you mm -hmm. want to go in and say yes to the opportunities as they come right. along. Right. Yeah, I had no idea that that's 
is that typical of how journalism works? Well, some someone will kind of see the work that you've done that may be sort of kind of related but unrelated, and then they'll say, hey, you should come over here and write about us and what we're doing? That's certainly how it's worked for me. I think that you know, there are people who specialize, you know, they, they like choose a, a lane in journalism and do it, you know, forever and stay mm -hmm. and and, um, and write about that same topic moving sometimes from public to, publication to publication. Um, and that works, too. I mean, if I had I guess if I hadn't been fortunate enough to have these cool jobs be offered to me, I would have gone hunting for mm -hmm. some, you know, to replace it. But. Um, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different subjects and I prefer the ones that I don't know a lot about. So I like diving into new things, sort of figuring, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. fashion industry, much like Las Vegas is full of crazy, interesting personalities, right? So. Yeah. Oh, yes. I've seen Zoolander. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's real. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, no, I can, I can kind of relate to you. I feel you know, very interested in a lot of topics where that's kind of why I started this podcast, where it's just called curiosityness. So I can talk about anything that's interesting that I'm curious about and, and have fun people on like you. And we can just talk about stuff, you know, that's, I love that. Um, well, that's very journalistic so. of you. Curiosity oh, okay. is what it needs to drive a journalist, right? So makes sense. Um, yeah. So I guess, can we just dive into the, the story of Vegas because well when were you doing when did you go to Vegas and start doing all that stuff what what was the timeline on that uh let's see when I first that was back in the late 90s when I okay. first arrived in Las Vegas like maybe 97 98 okay so the city looked very different then than it does now okay and so you were kind of you know doing like current what was going on at, currently at the time you were just reporting on stuff yeah, one story after another. I mean, at the moment when I when I got there, Steve Wynn had not yet built built Bellagio. Um, hmm. That was sort of I think that was one of the that was one of the first big projects that I covered the opening of. So, and there were still casinos, like there was one called the Desert Inn, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was sort of like the high end, lovely place back in the old days. I mean, that that was like Howard Hughes, like way early days of Las Vegas and they were some uh, of those old places were still around and you could kind of go in it felt cool because you were uh, sort of like wow that's that's the same wall that Bugsy touched or whatever you know it's kind of right yeah that is cool and I've had um I had a kind of a Vegas historian on on the podcast mm -hmm. and he works at the mom museum in the Vegas in Vegas and everything but he and we kind of covered the whole history of like I think uh, we started in like the 1850s or something and oh, went up yeah. to sort of like, yeah. So we, we kind of did that and went up to like the like 1980s or so. So this is kind of cool because you were, you, it's like you jumped in now and we can like hear the whole story about how this, how it worked after <laughs> that. And you yeah. were there like living it. I, I missed all the mob stuff. You know, people yeah. used to always ask me that like, oh, is the mob still there? And I was like, you know. <laughs> Actually, that I mean, there were some of the old mobsters who were still around. <coughs> um, excuse me. There's a restaurant in Las Vegas that. The <coughs> I'm so sorry. No There's a restaurant in Las Vegas that um, they used to. Some of the old alleged mobsters would go eat at. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've and heard one that. One of them got wheeled. I was in there one time, and one of them was wheeled in a wheelchair. And he had an oxygen tank, and the. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, it was just so shocking to to think that that man used to be really scary. That <laughs> <laughs> was a little old man with somebody pushing him and, and has to have oxygen to breathe. So yeah, no one can escape age, I guess. Nobody can escape age at all. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. That I mean, what I had kind of heard was you know the mob was sort of out, but they were they were still involved just as being you know kind of like stakeholders in you know in casinos and stuff like that, but not really like the way it used to be. Yeah. And then by the end of the nineties, they'd even cleaned them out as stakeholders. 
Oh, and okay. They wouldn't allow the, um, I mean, I guess I suppose they could have gone and bought stock on the New York Stock Exchange, but that's, that's how, the, they, when they went public, that wiped everybody out. There were no sort of private stakeholders anymore because they were all publicly traded. Oh, I see. That was, kind of, that was the end. So that had already taken place by the time I got there. So when I got there, it was one of the reasons that the Wall Street Journal was interested in having me cover it is this was big business and it was trading on Wall Street. And so there's, you know, mom and pop, both bonds and the, and the stocks. So, mm -hmm. um, but there was still this, I mean, and even to this date, there is still a lot of kind of fast and loose approach to the world in Las Vegas that's had, I mean, one of the reasons you probably came across my book was the whole Me Too thing really clashed there. Oh. So um, um, it came out. <coughs> I'm really sorry about the cough. Um, no worries. Last uh, January of 2018, the Wall Street Journal, not me, published a story kind of outing some, um, a lot of women who were who had been who said they'd been sexually harassed by Steve Wynn and mm -hmm. and if, I'll, if we want to cover this we can talk about it but I'm going to spin forward very quickly he ended up out of the company out, has nothing to do with Wynn Resorts anymore because of these allegations it turned out that some women had had um, been paid um, and signed non-disclosure agreements and whatnot and um, this week the Nevada Gaming Commission fined the company twenty million dollars for not having informed them that they that they had sort of keeping these things quiet all for all of those years and it's if it, this is sort of swept through very quickly in Las Vegas this is this town where I mean it's it, it's it's a playground right and it's 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 Sin City um, mm -hmm. and so it's always the place where secretaries and 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 accountants from Kansas City went and did things that they would never do at home mm -hmm. and um, that was sort of considered okay right up until about nine months ago oh man <laughs> now, <laughs> we'll see how all this impacts um, and it, it, Las Vegas it really it's it's certainly changing in the comp companies and it's probably gonna change in the, the whole ethos of the place so yeah Talk about the full spectrum from, you know, when the place was being was mobbed up and being run by mobsters till today um, when they're, you know, being very careful and send, sending housekeepers into clean rooms in pairs so that they won't be harassed by customers. Right. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't even heard of that story about with Steve Wynn. That's crazy. So he was. So essentially, the the company um, and Steve Wynn had had paid off these women not to say anything and had them sign non disclosure agreements. Yeah, there were a couple. Um, the, the Wall Street Journal article that ran um, in January of two thousand eighteen had um, quite a number of women. I think there were there was one allegation that really stood out the most. It was the most dramatic, and it was a payment of, I think it was seven and a half million dollars to a manicurist. Wow. Um, and um, it's never been revealed who she was or why the payment was that much. Um, mm -hmm. But um, in because casinos are closely regulated, that's something that happened because of the mob. Mm -hmm. um, and all casino executives have to have licenses and casinos themselves have to have licenses from the state gaming commissions. And right. um, and they are, they really investigate. I mean, there's gaming commissions take it seriously. They, I remember there's a case once where a, uh, an executive was coming up for his um, license review and he recently put in a new swimming pool and the gaming commission investigators went through all the receipts of what he was spending on the swimming pool and said, <clears throat> you're using way too many materials. No swimming pool requires this much concrete and this much rebar. Oh. And he, what you're talking about and it turned out that his contractor had been ripping him off and charging him for where way more and the gaming commission found it oh my gosh <laughs> they really investigate these guys it's not yeah. a joke and wow, so well, that's good and they all resent it i mean can you imagine it feels very intrusive um yeah, but sure. um you can imagine how they feel when they're going through that level of somebody's life mm -hmm. when they find out that and a company paid seven and a half billion dollars to a manicurist um, over a sexual harassment claim. So that's that's what led to 
everything that has happened. And I mean, it's a, it's fascinating because that company was started by Steve Wynn and his wife, Elaine, his ex-wife now, but they were married at the time, mm-hmm. and they're co-founders of the company. And when they divorced, it, you know, their shares got divided in two. And then last January, when he was forced out, he had to sell his stake in Wynn Resorts and, and hightail it out of town. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elaine Wynn, his ex-wife, became the largest shareholder of the company. Oh. And she sort of came in and, and started cleaning house and saying, we have to, what happened is all of his, his friends that had been on the board of directors um, and were forced to resign. Uh, a number of company executives who'd known about the payments were, were uh, for it fired. Mm-hmm. And so the company is kind of very new. Um, I think at least a third of the board is women, which is really unusual in Las Vegas. So I'm not kidding when I say there's like a real Me Too moment happening. Yeah. That's, that's particularly bizarre because it's such a male-dominated, male-oriented industry. Mm-hmm. Man, that is quite a shakeup. That's crazy. Um, my, my, I mean, I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't know how much customers really want Las Vegas to sort of get clean. I mean, you don't go there for good, clean fun. That's, That's true. The place. So we'll see. Very true. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's weird because it's almost you know. It, they market it as you know what state what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas like it's its own little bubble like it's kind of the, the rules don't apply in Vegas but apparently they do a little bit at least they do now yeah right. that's what I said for the last nine months <laughs> <laughs> jeez yeah interesting interesting so how like who is Steve Wynn how where did he come from and how did he kind of get involved in in Vegas he um. He was, it, it's almost like he was born for it. I mean, he grew, he grew up in North, um, upstate New York and, um, and then uh, went to college at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a, um, um, not an only child, but a very dominant child. And, um, you know, his friends have told me, his friends when he was a kid told me he was sort of very doted on by his parents and spoiled and had, you know, all the cool stuff. He had the cool parties and he had this great boat that all, all the high school kids would go out and play on in the, the summers and the lakes and stuff. Okay. And I think, um, you know, seeing him later, he, you know, he's a fascinating person to be around and there's something kind of, um, it's very forceful personality and very charismatic man and extremely, almost bizarrely sure of himself. He just just not a man who has self doubts, right? Um, I mean, a little bit like as I was calling covering Donald Trump at the same time, and um, it's, Steve and Donald hated each other back then, but um, they later both became Republicans and became, you know sort of teamed up, and that all shifted. But back in the very early days, they were were maybe you call them frenemies, you know? But okay. you know, they're not the same personalities at all. Um, mm-hmm. Steve Wynn is very creative. Um, so he <clears throat> wound up in Las Vegas and um, mo- mostly because he was fascinated with it. I mean, it, he was just drawn to it. He didn't have uh-huh. any particular um, need to be there. But he um, sort of made some friends that were, were um, helpful to him and bought a piece of land and then bought another piece of land and then decided to build a casino. And, um, you know, again, it's sort of one foot in front of the other, although. In his case, he was really pushing and pressing for um, opportunities, and he just fell in love with building things. Mm-hmm. The man loves to build. He loves to design. Wax, you know, he will wax poetic on, and you just can't believe those sort of projects that he'll dive into the details on. You know, if he's, if he's building a golf course, he wants to know what kind of grass and where the trees are going to be placed, and he's just a sort of born to it or he was i mean it's hard for me to imagine him now not being involved in any of it because he fed off of it so much yeah really that's cool so that that's kind of admirable that he was so you know detail focused and and involved with every aspect of stuff he was building every aspect i mean just totally you know he would he would be talking about design of a hotel room and if there was 
you know, going to be a lamp. He wanted to know what color of the light was going to be that it would would shine on. And he, he would mock these things up and then walk through what the rooms were going to be like. Um, you know, I remember one time just before he was opening, it was this is the Wynn Resort. He um, was walking through some of the restaurants. This is like a week or two before it opened. And I was in there with him. And the restaurants were... Um, you know, that were in there, several of them were sort of designed by the restaurateurs from that restaurant. So they were celebrity chefs. And uh -huh. there was one, Steve didn't like the art that they placed on the wall and had just a fit, you know, and just said, this is not going to work. Customers aren't going to like it. I don't like uh -huh. it. Poor chef owner is standing there kind of going, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Wowza. Yeah. Crazy. I had no idea that he was like that. So what was, I mean, what was his education or, or background or training? Did he have anything like that? Or was he just sort of naturally inclined to, to think of that stuff and care about it? You know, I'm trying to remember now what he was. He, he, he has an undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And I feel like it was in English. I should know. I can't remember. I have one. I'm pretty sure it was a liberal arts. There's nothing, had absolutely nothing to do with what he did. Huh. later in life and he always had like he's not a trained architect but he kept a drafting table next to his architect's drafting table mm. and sort of shoved that guy aside and grabbed the markers and just start drawing all over the blueprints to kind of show what he wanted uh -huh. uh, and i mean in it to be honest with you i mean this is you know steve Wynn's first really major mark on Las Vegas was the Mirage Casino, which at the time was famous. It still it has a volcano in front that sort of erupts. It's total kitsch, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody had done anything like that before. Oh, okay. And, and so he was the person that brought in this idea of themes for these resorts. Then he built Treasure Island, which had, you know, it was all about pirates and, and actually had a like a pirate battle that used to take place every hour. Right. To walk by and see. Um, and then he built Bellagio, which has those fountains. That was his sort of ode to, to luxury. And he mm -hmm. was the person who told everybody that Las Vegas could be luxury. Uh, at, at about that time, he was always also pursuing other passions. And, mm -hmm. and the, at the Mirage, he had been on vacation in Hawaii and had an opportunity to swim with dolphins and decided that he needed to have his own dolphins. So he built a dolphin pool at the Mirage and <laughs> rescued a bunch of dolphins and used to swim with them. But they also became an attraction for the Mirage Resort. So people right. could buy, he had his own private little docking area where he could kind of go in and, um, you know, have a cup of tea and swim with the dolphins. Swim with the dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Involved. One of them got pregnant and he was there for the birth. And I mean, yeah, he was intensely involved with that. But anyway, then he moved on from that and started collecting art. And that was when he was building Bellagio. And um, he got obsessed with it and started spending a lot of money. Mm. And a lot of the money that he was spending was actually the casino company's money. And it was publicly traded casino with investors who were looking at this going, why did we just buy a Picasso? Right. And um, the investors got upset. And mm -hmm. one of Steve's, Steve Wynn's major competitors, um, a guy by the name of Kirk Kikorian, got wind of it. And Kikorian had always kind of lusted after Steve Wynn's properties. So he, he um, through some very slick maneuvering um sort of managed to force win into a position where th there was a going to be an eruption of of his um, of his investors and um Kirkwood forced steve win to sell his his company and so oh. bought the company so then kirk Kirkorian, now the company mgm owns um and owns all those properties that we've been talking about, the Mirage, Bellagio, um, tre you know, Treasure Island. And, Treasure Island, uh, right. And a few others. But um, And Wynn kind of left the industry for a year and licked his wounds and bought the Desert Inn, which I mentioned to you. And he imploded the Des Desert Inn and built the Wynn Resort and sort mm -hmm. of built another company. 
so we now know the Wynn Resort and the and the Encore, which is part of it. They're building one in Boston. It's sort of and it's also a public traded company. So, man, just bounce right back, huh? Sure. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, gnarly. And so you've gotten to you know meet him and interact with him a bit just through through journalism. Yeah, for ten years. I don't see nice. him anymore, but right. I, but I spent a lot of time with him over the years. It's, it you know I. I would spend a lot of time with him as he was building new properties just to see him in action and what he was doing because everything that he did was just another step toward changing the face of Las Vegas. And he mm -hmm. thought, I mean, this is not a man who thought small. He, you know, every single property he built, all the people around him were completely freaked out that he was spending too much money and making it too fantastic and that it wouldn't work out. And, and uh -huh. I mean, it's just time and time again, there'd be stories written and people talking about what a terrible idea this was. And he was out of his mind now. And of course it would always, I mean, they were just one huge success after another that, that drew more and more people to Las Vegas. And I think there's a business concern now and an economic concern for Las Vegas that the, the city, the town does no longer has, a forceful personality like that that's um oh and and for instance the company after he left last year pulled way back on its next set of development plans which he'd been in pursuing at full throttle interesting um so i you know i i think it's actually a time to be cautious about um the future of las vegas because i don't they don't they don't have the kind of driving force that they've had for the last 40 years there Oh, okay. That's an interesting. They don't have the the kind of visionary to see to to push everybody and man, yeah, that's how do you think he kind of this just overwhelming like self-confidence and drive to do that? Like how where does that come from? Do you have any idea? <laughs> if you if you do, <laughs> you can put it in a bottle and sell it. Yeah, and right. Then, Honestly, I went back when I was working on the book and, sp and spoke to people who'd known him since he was a little kid, and it was perfectly clear that he had had that from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But that's completely in his genes somehow. He was that same person. Right. And it's, you know, that it's two <clears throat> things. It's because not only did he completely believe, I mean, if you want to, if you want to compare two people and their business careers in that industry, let's go back, and I'm not talking about Donald Trump in the sense of his presidency and what's going on now, but in the years that Donald Trump and Steve Wynn were building casino companies and competing with one another, um, they both had incredible confidence and belief in themselves to go forth and do things, but it was Steve Wynn who made tons of money at it, um, built two publicly traded companies, made a ton of money for his investors, and mm -hmm. changed the face of the city where he where most of his development was. Um, and and so Wynn has, you know, he's really got a lot of business smarts in addition to the creativity and that just the chutzpah. Yeah, it all happen. It's not a, you know, I, he 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 even changed. He when when gambling opened another country on Mississippi they they legalized gambling and he he built um a a, a, a casino down there that was on the river where it was riverboat casinos mm -hmm. and down there when it opened and and lived in the hotel for a week and ordered room service and just put it through its 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 paces to make sure everything was working right and I remembered it they kept getting his room service wrong oh jeez like if they get my room service wrong, what's happening in this place? And just had to just clean house. And like, yeah, man. Yeah, I wonder if it's, uh, you know, how many people there are that have a similar kind of self-confidence and drive and, and uh, you know, sort of don't – are willing to take a lot of risks, but uh, – you know, we don't hear about because they took that huge risk and, and it didn't work out for them. You know, like, I wonder if that's the trait that really drives success or if that's one trait along with, you know, he also had the business smarts and the creativity and everything. I think you're right. You have, you have to have both. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there may be some people that have both. I, you know, I spent, I mean, in 23 years writing for the Wall Street Journal, I interviewed a lot of entre- entrepreneurs and in, in different industries, there's still a type now. I feel like I can, I can almost just recognize it when I see it. I mean, there's an, the, the, the type of person that just can't stop starting new businesses. Mm-hmm. And often they have, they have lots of failures before they really hit on something. I'm trying to, you know, the guy who, who founded Tom's, the shoe company, Tom's mm-hmm. Shoe, Blake, um, I'm blanking on his last name, but he, um, he's another, I mean, he's not a Steve Wynn character, but he's a, he's a super confident, um, obsessed entrepreneur who gets ideas and wants to pursue them. And he had a whole bunch of ideas for businesses before he lit on this idea of Tom's and the, you know, giving away shoes for every, giving away a pair of shoes for every shoe you buy and whatnot. And the right. other, some of, some of them just failed really badly. Yeah. Like, you know, that's the thing. Then they pick themselves up and start again. I mean, you'd have to say that Steve Wynn failed really badly when he was forced to sell Mirage Resorts. Mm-hmm. And so he licked his wounds and started over and boom. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is that, you know, these guys, it's not like they don't fail because they do just yeah. like everyone, but then they, they just keep going. Cause yeah, that's, I've been, it, it I find that very interesting. Cause I, um, I have looked into and, and, and kind of find, uh, Rob Deerdeck very fascinating. I'm not sure if you know who that is. Um, he's just essentially like he was a pro skateboarder who now he built, uh, you know, turned in, made a show on MTV, had a couple shows on MTV and has started all these businesses. And now he, he's like an entrepreneur that's kind of like an incubator for more businesses. And he's just turned into like kind of this huge mogul and, and launches things on his, uh, on his, um, TV shows. And he's just really interesting to me. And he talked about how as a kid, he had this like drive and just confidence and he didn't know like where it came from, but he was kind of recounting all these events as that seemed monumental to him as a child. And, and one was, he just called up a skate, you know, company and said, if I could sell 10 tickets, can I get into your, your skate demo for free? And he's like, I don't know why I did that, but he's like, I just did all these things and everything I tried to do, he succeeded at and he was extremely successful everything he did so he's like i just didn't know failure until i was like 30 when i finally started a huge company and it really failed but he's like i just had this confidence ever since i was young because i didn't know failure which i find interesting it's yeah i mean that sounds like the type honestly it's confidence and um and hard work too Oh when yeah. He about it, he wants to. He's going to sell ten tickets. He had to go out and sell ten tickets. You know, he's like willing to hustle mm-hmm. to get this whatever it was that he wanted. So that I mean that that hustle is really a big part of it too. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Ooh. Okay. So uh, I'm. You kind of mentioned this just in passing, but I'm curious about it because uh, you know all the stuff that you've learned about Vegas and and kind of living there and checking it out. Did you? You mentioned like how they just casinos just move money around and stuff like how they do that do you have any can you answer that and then do you have any other fun little things about you know vegas tidbits or weird things that you wouldn't think about but happen all day oh my god there's so many of them goes on um the money thing has changed a lot of course because now um vegas used to be nothing but cash and they literally tons of change (laughs) you know the slot machines right and i don't i don't i don't i'm not talking about metaphorical tons i'm talking about the weight yeah. yeah. Um, but as uh, as sort of electronic means have have right. have gone on, they um, you know that's not as much of an issue. Although some people really still like the, the all that cash, you know, like change pouring out of a slot machine is very exciting it's to fun. people. People who play a lot, excuse me, slot machines um, are very. It's Pavlovian. It's like Pavlov's dogs. They're very responsive to the sights and the sounds. And so they have to be very careful to um, create sounds that sort of excite people. It, 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 it literally causes their bodies to produce endorphins and they respond by gambling more. And not everybody mm-hmm. behaves that way in the, the, in this brain science and some people respond to it and don't. But so huh. the, 
the um, but the way that cash has traditionally been moved around casinos is in big carts. You can't move an armored truck around this casino floor. And yeah. so you have these people and, and they don't look very interesting. You could walk past one and think it was a coffee cart or something if you didn't really know what you're looking at. But they, you know, they're like in the same way the meter lady goes around, um, you know, and for parking meters, if they are still using cash, then they, they would fill um, and, and take cash out of, slot machines. I remember one time in, this was in Atlantic City, not in, in Las Vegas, but there was a shooting. Um, it was a robbery of one of those carts. And the way they usually would move around, there's, there's two people. So there's somebody pushing the cart and there's a guard walking with them. Mm -hmm. And um, um, somebody went in with a gun, got it into the casino and, um, and shot the person that was pushing the um, the cart and they were trying to rob the cart and get it out of the casino and there's I saw the vid the, the the video surveillance video of what happened so this they're, they're by these casinos and there are people standing there there were like four or five of them playing the slot machines as this is happening literally right behind them somebody was shot yeah. and they looked for a second and kept playing <laughs> oh my gosh of course <laughs> that, jeez. <laughs> and you see like the, the police come and they're like I mean this is all of this stuff and the, the people are just like working the slot machine <laughs> wow they're on a hot streak they can't be bothered now there's a gun oh man that was unbelievable I learned so much about the mentality of some gamblers for that it's, it's just it's so focused yeah oh my gosh but that's really how it works when the, the, the company Harrah's um, which owns, um, you know, Harrah's Casinos and Caesars, and it's not called Harrah's anymore. But that this happened at a Harrah's brand casino. They were they were doing studies of gamblers and what would cause them to um, get discouraged and walk away, as opposed to stay and keep playing. And they they learned that they had to get some little payout with some frequency, or mm -hmm. they would get discouraged and quit. And so then they were they were experimenting with how what what do you give people like what what is enough of a little reward so that you keep gambling and they found that it could be um as little as having an employee come by and say how about a free cup of coffee and give you a voucher for a free cup of coffee and so they started doing this and indeed they found that um that they could they they would actually had monitoring stations and they could monitor how people were playing so they could see them on their monitors in the little closet and say, oh, this person has a long le losing streak. We better send Chloe out there with a coffee voucher. Oh, my gosh. And they would send Chloe out there. And, do that. and after a while, they were able, I mean, you, 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 then you start to use kind of low-level AI and algorithms and whatnot to program it so that the machine will also just, you know. Light up and light up, yeah. Bucks, you know, or whatever, so. Right. It's not oh my it's very, very programmed and scientific these days. Yeah. I mean, of course it is like everything is. So that, that makes sense of that if they're doing that, but it's just, it's crazy how we're everyone in there is just like uh, part of a big experiment to see how much money we can give this casino. Yep. Yep. Man. Pretty much. <laughs> Scary. Crazy. One of the problems for Las Vegas though, that they started dealing with, um, um, quite a few years ago was, was the fact that um, it was becoming less and less a gambling place. Mm, and, yeah. and they, and, and first, you know, it was men would go and then they bring their wives and then somebody was like, well, what are the wives going to do if they don't want to gamble? And so then they started building shopping for the wives and, and sort of adding on new layers of things. And then they, then that they started adding more entertainment and the shows got more expensive. It used to be that gambling subsidized every single search. So the food was cheap. I mean, Las Vegas was famous for those all-you-can-eat buffets, right? Yeah. Um, and then they started having to charge more for those things because people weren't gambling as much. And so now Las, the Las Vegas revenues from gambling are, as a percentage of total revenues are way lower than they used to be because they're making so much more from the shows and the food and the shopping. And oh, what. okay. Interesting. So why do you um, – is there any reason really why the – the gambling has gone down so much. Why people are gambling less? Because more people are going, and they're not all gamblers. Oh, I see. It's more so, of just a travel destination now. Yeah, and the conference. I mean, you know, 
thousands of people running around with name tags. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like, and so the, and the conference go, I mean, that's Las Vegas, literally the economy of Las Vegas changes week by week, depending on what big conferences are in town, because they tend that they have the, the conference goers tend to be, um, you know, sort of like personalities, you know? So mm -hmm. if you have the famously, um, the, they're, they have, there's a trucking convention that would go in and truckers are great gamblers. And so that would, that was always a good one. Um, the rodeo convention was always a good one for the casinos. Yeah. But they have, um, they have, um, oh, what is it called? It's the electronics conference that's there. Oh, uh, CES. Yeah, CES. The mm -hmm. casinos hate CES. Oh, really? Dudes don't gamble. And so, but they, but, and they, and they don't, they often, I, I, how do I put this delicately? They they want to go to the girly shows that are not the really extreme ones that are not in the casinos. So oh. that's terrible for the casinos because those guys actually leave the casino and go to these other joints. So it's all so they actually have to adjust the pricing for rooms and food when CES is in town. So they make more money for the rooms and food because they know they're not going to make it in the casino. Oh, okay, I see. Wow, crazy. The stuff, yeah, stuff you don't even think of, but it, it makes sense that, of course, that would happen. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was talking to the, when this guy, he's, you know, involved with Vegas now and stuff, and they, he talked about how now they're bringing in, they just brought in a hockey team, and, and the Raiders are coming there now, so now they're going to have even more sporting events to bring in more people for, besides gambling, so it's all. Yeah, and that, that actually, it's, that's a fascinating development because, they used to say that Las Vegas could never have a professional sports enterprise because the NFL or, you know, whatever league it was, wouldn't, they were so worried about gambling and sort of besmirching their reputation that they wanted to stay away from it. But Las mm -hmm. Vegas has cleaned up its reputation so much now. Mm -hmm. that, and it's become a, a larger city, but, you know, but. It's not yeah. the size of the city that's allowing that. It's sort of it's it's shifting perceptions about what Las Vegas is and how bad it is. So yeah, that morally, right? Yeah, it is very different. Well, it's it's a huge community now too. There's so much like suburbs to, around Vegas and everything too now. It's one giant suburb. Yeah, totally. Um, man, cool. So, I mean, I want to talk about a little bit of like kind of what you've been up to lately or like what you're excited about. Cause you, I saw you interviewed the, uh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen fairly recently, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very that cool. Cause fun. they have, they have a fashion brand. Is that, is that why you talked to them? Yeah. I was talking about that. They have a couple of fashion brands, but primarily the one, the row, I mean, they've completely moved on from their, um, from their, you know, initial Hollywood lives. Did you oh, watch wow. the show when you were a kid? Was that, were you a fan? Uh, what were they were full house is that what they were uh yeah they were the they they were they're twins and they um and they shared the role of the littlest kid right i mean i never really watched and it then, but... but after later they got they grew up and they had um they did a bunch of videos just as sort of child actresses up until they were in their teens oh okay yeah i'm not i'm not too familiar with their <laughs> oh, i thought maybe you asked me about them because you have been a fan that was <laughs> oh no no it was really funny because um i, I it, that, I don't, they don't talk in the press very often, so there's not a lot out there. So as soon as that story it was in WSJ Magazine, as soon as that story hit, People Magazine picked, I mean, it was just like all over the place. Um, and it, you know, it didn't really, you know, they, they picked up on sort of various things that, that, that Mary-Kate and Ashley had said about, um, you know, their personal lives and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so, um, I realized that there were a lot of people who were intensely interested, not in their fashion brand or their company, but just in their personal lives. Just in them, because they're kind of reclusive now. They're more <laughs> mysterious. They're not reclusive. They just, um, I think they had rocky adolescences. And mm -hmm. they, were, they were constantly in the tabloid press. as they, One of them had an eating disorder and blah, blah, blah. blah you know, That's right. They to avoid anything like that at all. And yeah. one of them now is married to um, the brother of Nicolas Sarkozy, the former president of France. So that she has like a, you know, a whole serious life there going. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's like, just not an adolescent. But I mean, yeah. you know, I interviewed, um, 
I was fascinated actually. Uh, uh, about two months ago, I interviewed May Musk, Elon Musk's mom. Oh, I, okay. I was just so fascinated to do that interview because I'm, I mean, I'm Elon Musk is like a phenomenon. I mean, who's yeah. that big? Honestly, right. I mean, if you think Steve Wynn thinks big, oh my yeah. God, the guy, like, totally. That's going to remake the world. Um, and so I was curious about, like, what kind of a person raises a kid like that, right? Yeah, like, how did that happen? That's crazy. Well, in talking to her, I completely realized I, it's like he's a chip off the old block. She's so, I mean, she's now a fashion model and at, you know, in, at 70. She's a oh, cover, really? Literally is a cover girl. Yeah. Oh. Go, you'll see her, you know, she's this elegant woman with this gray hair. She's never had any plastic surgery or any work done. She's just, she says, I model my age. I'm 70. Yeah. And, um, and she's on every red carpet and going to the Met Ball and blah, blah. But then <laughs> she's just, she's just like all about science. And she's kept talking about science. She's a nutritionist originally. And um, she kept like veering away from all this glamour stuff to talk about her bean recipe, bean soup recipe and kind of healthy eating and the periodic table. And, and then she, you know, should think about, she keeps very close tabs on, on um, the press for her son, Elon, mm -hmm. and sort of counts negative articles. And, um, she, at one point it was, She's getting very upset and saying, you know, I, people write all these negative things about my son and they, they talk about him like he's crazy and he's not crazy at all. And and I was sort of trying to point out to her that some of the things he does seem kind of big and extreme. And I mentioned that, you know, we were seeing all these reports that he was like trying to trying to increase Tesla production and working so hard last summer. He was sleeping on the floor of the factory. And she like reared back and she said, well, of course he was sleeping on the factory floor of the factory. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Like duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a product of environment and upbringing, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think they they're a very hard working family. Talk oh, about yeah. Both. Yeah, because his whole his brothers or his cousins or something are you know are also doing similar stuff with uh, whatever their um, solar panel company is called. No, that's his company. He's the solar panel company too. That's Elon. He does Tesla. He does Solar City. He Solar has, City, that's right. He has he has um, the uh, what's it called the rocket company sending um, satellites. SpaceX. Up into space. SpaceX. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's the boring company where he's going to bore holes under Southern California so that cars could sort of zip underneath the surface mm -hmm. instead of driving on the surface. So it's like he does not think small. No, no, uh, not at all. It, but his, he does his both his siblings. He has a brother and a sister, and they're both entrepreneurs too. And May was very sensitive about giving equal time. So that's good. Yeah. yeah, that would be a tough position. That that's, yeah. I wonder what that family, you know, Thanksgiving is like at that table. I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of big personalities at one table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, well, that's that's so fun that you get to get to you know talk to people like that and and ask them questions. It's so fun. That's totally what I want to do, and and I'm trying to do with this show. So that's that's cool to hear. Um, yes. So what was your? I want to hear about the uh, your experience about driving the Ferrari. What was that like? That was really funny. Um, again, it's it's not you know I'm not a Ferrari kind of person, and when this happened, this was a Ferrari that was it was a new Ferrari for the company. And they were bringing it into the United States to introduce it. And um, the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal was supposed to get to drive it and had to cancel for some reason. He was going to fly out from New York because it was coming into the West Coast. And so an editor emailed me and said, we'd like you to drive his Ferrari and write a story about it. And I emailed him back. I was like, oh, please find somebody else. I drive a Subaru with two kids' seats in the back. Like, right. I don't know anything about transmissions. I just don't, like, no. And he wrote me back, that's your lead, saying that I should lead the story, saying I drive a suit brewer with two kid seats in the back. Okay. And um, so I realized he was sort of game or whatever. And I, so I hustled around and, and did a bunch of reporting about what Ferraris were like. I called a few executives that I knew that happened to be collectors of Ferraris so I could talk with them. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one of the people I called was Elaine Wynn because she oh. wrote Ferrari. 
And I, I, I asked her, I said, what should, you know, like, what should I expect? What should I do? Do you have any advice for me? And she goes, she pauses and she goes, wear pants. <laughs> I was like, what? I thought she told me something about driving, you know, like, why? Well, right. Wear <laughs> that when you sit down in a car that's that low, if you were wearing a skirt, it could be really hard. Like, it, she was right. Okay. Yeah. Pants is a smart thing to do. <laughs> so I wore pants and drove the Ferrari. And um, we drove, um, it was hilarious. We drove up to Mulholland Drive and we were driving along Mulholland Drive. And I've never had other drivers be so polite and respectful of me. They w People were just waving me in front of them. And I realized it's because they wanted to see the car. Yeah. So Because you can really hear it. There's a Ferrari sound. Mm -hmm. Oh, down Rodeo Drive and sort of people you know saw people's heads being turned and whatnot and then we got when i wasn't driving the the ferrari guy um drove me through parts of beverly hills i think we were on beverly drive maybe i can't remember one of those streets in downtown beverly hills it's a residential street mm -hmm. and he wanted to show me what the pickup was like and so he just like jammed the accelerator down and it, literally my head snapped back yeah like took off so fast it was like riding a fucking bronco and made this huge noise and i was like we are so arrested <laughs> like this <laughs> god run residential street in beverly hills and, um it turned out he had like a lot of tickets <laughs> of course <laughs> for points on license and he also didn't even get to drive i mean he ferrari salesmen don't make enough money to drive ferraris themselves unfortunately I have some other little car, but um, oh well. <laughs> you <had a> lot <laughs> get of tickets from, from taking clients out for test drives. <laughs> right, it's a business expense, I guess. I guess it's pretty expensive. <laughs> oh um, man, sure. but it was fun. It was a good. That was a that was a delightful piece to write, and nice. I did lead with my Subaru. Nice, very good lead. So people who own Subarus, look into that Ferrari. Look into that. <laughs> Do you know what the problem with it though is for, actually I realized this um, because of that trip and then this, uh, this another another Ferrari experience I had that um, it's actually a bit of an albatross because you can't just go park a Ferrari in a lot of parking lots like the people who drive Ferraris are very worried about them mm -hmm. um, and are like constantly you know giving really big tips to the valet guys to really keep an eye on the car or park it in a particular place and whatnot so. I think yeah. I'll stick with, I'll, I don't have a Subaru anymore, but I'll stick with my park, <laughs> park where I want to park. Yeah, that's so true. Because I, I mean, on a smaller level, I, I bought my first car that I really bought was a, a Dodge Challenger that was black and I bought it brand new and everything. And it just was like, it was just too much of a stress on my life because I just didn't want to park it next to other cars and get door dings or scratches. Yeah. And I... I washed it every week, so now I just I sold that and I just own a Jeep and I can beat it up and it's great. <laughs> Much better. Yeah, life's easier with a Jeep. That's that's for sure. Whew, man, well, Christina, this is awesome. Oh, what was that? We don't need more stress in our lives. No, very true. More, more money, more problems, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes. Man, well, um, I'll, I want to respect your time and, and let you get going, but yeah, I really, really... Uh, appreciate you you talk to me it's it's fun to to talk to you i, I love all your stories and, and all the stuff you've done it's, it's great this has been a pleasure cool so if people want to follow you and, and we can get your book on amazon winner takes all is that right that's right okay if you I'll want have to follow me on twitter i'm binkley on style okay on twitter perfect i'll throw a link to that any other social stuff or just twitter is the best i, do. I have instagram but i don't do as much with it my instagram is christina binkley my name oh Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw links to to that in the show notes so people can uh, click on that and check you out and, and follow up with everything you're doing. Super. But uh, cool. Well, appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, Christina. Thanks. My pleasure. Keep going with your curiosity. Will do. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.